can use the chat box or raise your hand with the button on the bottom of the screen. Uh, please try to make sure your name on Zoom has your first and your last name so that we can do proper attendance for pesticide points. You will need to be present for the whole session to receive points and your receipts will be emailed out to you within two weeks. The barcode for certified crop advisor credits will be available at the end of the day and these sessions will be recorded for your reference and be emailed later. So up first, we have Jennifer Foster. She's the Agronomic Services Manager with Syngenta Canada, and she's gonna do an update on their new fungicide, Moravis. Floor is yours, Jen. Yeah, great. Yeah, so Eric and I are here here this morning together. Eric's your local sales rep, and I'm, I'm the person who sits in Guelph for the time being. I uh, can't travel too much these days, but yeah, I'm excited to, to talk to you all about Miravis. I, uh, you know, we sold it, started selling it last year on a few crops and, and the labels have expanded. So today I'm going to go through those crops that are really most relevant for growers in Nova Scotia, uh, in the Valley and, and elsewhere. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll get going here. So yeah, it's all about Miravis. So I, and uh, I returned to Canada a year ago, all right? So, but before that, I worked for 10 years for Syngenta uh, in research and development. And, you know, I was part of the, the gang that developed this product and it's exciting to come back and, and actually start selling it and getting it in the hands of the growers. Cause you know, Eric and I meet every couple of weeks to have a chat. And one, one resounding thing the last year is we always learn more about our products once the growers start using it. So hopefully uh, we can get it tried out this year in, in your fields and get that feedback and understand more about this, this molecule. So yeah, uh, this morning there's going to be three things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a depidin. What is that? It's the new uh, mode of action that we have in this, in the Miravis brands. Then I'm going to talk about Miravis Duo and Miravis Prime. And, you know, it's not always the easiest when we have the same brand with a different suffix, but hopefully it's, it's clear by the end what Duo is for and what Prime is for. So first up with a Depidin, it, it's a carboxamide or a group seven or an SDHI. And the reason why we're excited about it is it's really the next generation of this class of chemistry. And, you know, on the screen, we have, have the molecule and, and it's, that's what makes it different and special from the other carboxamides. It's actually been put into an, its, its own group by the, the resistance committee. And we've essentially separated it into three groups here to make people like Eric and I understand it a little bit better. First, we have power. So that's the carboxyl group. This is really what uh, is shared by all of the carboxamides in this class. But with, with Miravis, what happens with that carboxyl group is it gives it its potency and also its efficacy. Then on the right-hand side, we, we have what we call stamina. And this is the lipophilic part. And this is really what gives it the length of control. This AI metabolizes slowly, which means it stays in the plant and protects the plant for, for quite a while. Then in the middle, we have spectrum. One of the unique things about adepidin is really its spectrum. And this is what makes it different from the other carboxamides. So if we focus still on, on broad spectrum, you see uh, three boxes on the screen. The first is, is with powdery mildew. Powdery mildew, uh, a terrible disease in, in many crops, right? Caused by different pathogens, but all bucketed under powdery mildew. What we've seen with Adepidin and with Miravis brands is, you know, we're really getting at a lot of those powdery mildew species. In the middle, this is where we have the leaf spot and blight bucket. So, you know, Cercospora, Alternaria, Stemphilium and onions, uh, Septorian wheat, this isn't a wheat call, but Septorian wheat as well. Then on the far right side, this is where we're, we're picking up those really miserable diseases for lack of a better word. You know, the botrytis, the sclerotinia, the gummy stem blights, those really difficult to manage diseases. And this is, these are the three buckets. So powdery mildew, leaf spots, and then those difficult diseases that cause those rots. That's really the spectrum of a depidin. So when it comes to how it works, you know, I touched on the long lasting effect. 
And if we go through, this is a looking inside of a leaf, right? And you see the leaf surface where the product is applied. And we have really good surface tenacity. What does that mean? It means it, it, it lands and it spreads. The droplet spreads on, on the surface itself. It doesn't bounce. Bouncing is bad, right? Then it moves quite rapidly into that wax layer and it forms this reservoir, this protective layer right there in the wax layer on the top of the leaf surface or right below the leaf surface, I should say. Slowly then over time, it moves into the leaf tissue. This will give you again, the long lasting effect and some even move slowly up the xylem. So that means it's that upward movement towards the leaf tips and, and towards the growing point itself. Again, that movement is slow, and this has ultimately led to the long lasting effect we see in the crop. The other thing I mentioned is potency. Here's an example with botrytis. All right, so these are petri dishes where we put different doses of a depidin, fluxoperoxid, which is a circadus, and it's also in Maribon, and then fluopyram, which you know in vellum prime if you're a potato grower, or uh, Luna tranquility, right? So these are common. Uh, carboxamides in, in this class. What we did here is, like I said, we have different doses. So you see under the first dish for a depidin, it says 100. It's 100 parts per million. And then we went all the way down to 0.01. Across multiple species, what we've seen with a depidin is this step change. And for step change, what that means, it's a laboratory term. And you have to have at least 10 times more activity than the, the previous active ingredients or products. So you see the big arrows on the screen, that's pointing out this step change. So a depidin is suppressing the botrytis in the dish at 0.1, whereas the other carboxamides are at one. So it's a tenfold increase. Now, you know, these are studies in a dish and, you know, people like me get excited about it. And the cool thing about a depidin in Miravis is we've seen it translate to the field. All right, that's, that's rather unique. Usually, uh, when we're developing AIs and we get really excited in the lab, you know, the, the field results are pretty good. But in this case, we've seen a step change of activity with Miravis. And so that's really, really why people like Eric and I are, are excited about this molecule. So now we're going to launch into the actual products themselves. So we have Miravis Duo is, is the first one. This is a depidin plus diphenaconazole. So diphenaconazole, you may be familiar with it in the top brands from Syngenta. So we have a Provia top, Quadris top. Top means diphenaconazole. Now, you know, we've switched it to Duo just to confuse the issue a bit more. But bottom line is, it's, it's a mixture of a Depidin and a group three in, in diphenaconazole. The, the main take home message for this is Miravis Duo is your leaf spot and your powdery mildew product. Now on the screen, you see all, all the crops that are registered there, the crop groups in many cases, and you see the long list of diseases. But like I said, it's all about leaf spots or leaf blights and powdery mildew. So it's registered in, in root vegetables, so carrots, tuberous veg, so 1C, that's, I don't know if there's any sweet potatoes yet falling in, into the valley, but you know, that's, uh, that's tuberous veg, but also potato, obviously. Bulb veg, so are onions, brassica veg, uh, in this case, it, it's, it's head and stem. So none of the leafy brassicas, but that includes, we do have cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, all those traditional coal crops um, on the label. Fruiting vegetables, so, so tomatoes and peppers. I don't think that's an area of focus for the valley yet. And then we have the cucurbits. And I know there's a few squash that we can find in the valley. And one thing, you know, Eric, last year you experienced is that step change in powdery mildew. The use rate is simple. Across most crops, it's 0.4 liters per acre. In brassica veg, we have uh, a rate range, so 0.3 to 0.4. The PHIs are favorable for the crops, depending on when they're typically harvested, right? So between zero and, and 14 day uh, pre-harvest interval. And the last thing to point out is, is the adjuvant piece. So in most of these crops, we don't need an adjuvant, but in those waxy leaved crops, like bulb vegetables and brassica vegetables, we do recommend the addition of a non-ionic surfactant. The reason for that is, is that bounce, that surface tenacity that I was talking about earlier with the waxy leaves, you know, even though a depidin has good surface tenacity, we, we do see a little bit of that bounce. 
So to prevent the, the product bouncing off the leaves and landing on the soil, that's why we recommend the addition of an adjuvant. But of course, that, rec that uh, depends on what else you have in the tank, right? I know in onions in particular, we're making several passes with, with different uh, AIs, foliar feeds, uh, insecticides, et cetera. And same in, in some brassica veg as well. Um, so yeah, just reach out to Eric if you're, if you're looking at large tank mixes and, and he can come back to you with uh, the, the, what we've tested so far. Uh, from an MRL perspective, uh, it says Miravis, I'm at the bottom, but it's Miravis Duo. So we have harmonized MRLs with the US, so with Canada and the US, uh, but I don't think anybody exports these crops outside of North America, but if you do, just reach out to Eric for an update on, on where we are with MRLs. So this is an example of what we saw in, in zucchini last year uh, and also in butternut squash two years ago in Ontario. So on the left-hand side, this is a picture Eric sent along to me, and you can see the grower program compared to when Miravis Duo was included in the program on the right-hand side. Zucchini, multiple picked crop, right? You go through, we're banging up those plants. We need to keep the powdery mildew to a, li a minimum, right? Because otherwise you're, you're, you can't harvest your crop for that much longer. What you see with the Miravis Duo, it just has brighter, greener, uh, disease-free leaves, right? So this is, again, that step change in activity we've seen with Miravis Duo for powdery mildew. And then on the right-hand side, this is the example we have from when we did research authorizations or demos in Ontario. What the grower noted here is they included Miravis Duo twice in their, their foliar spray program. And they felt, you see on the left-hand side, so butternut squash in Ontario, it's picked twice. They go through the field twice, usually. And that's because there's a lot of damage. You see on the right hand side, you know, when you start dragging those carts and, and have your labor going through the field, right? We're, we're picking squash. So, you know, things are going to get banged up a bit. What the grower noted though, is they could probably have gone through the Miravis Duo side a third time if they had a market for that squash. So, you know, it's just holding on those plants that much longer. We're recommending uh, Miravis Duo is applied later in the season. Uh, so after fruit set, during fruit development, that's really, again, zero day PHI. So in a multi-pick crop like, like zucchini, you don't have to worry about PHI. We have a 12 hour re-entry. So if you spray the day before, your, your, your workers can go in the next day to pick. And again, we're recommending it during fruit development. This is so that it holds on that crop as long as you need to pick. Next up is onions, right? You know, we have a lot of onions in the valley and, and really this is bringing two modes of action for foliar disease in onion. Last year, we had uh, research authorizations placed across the country. Examples on the screen are, are green onions in Quebec. We had bulb onions in Ontario, and then we had bulb onions out, out in Nova Scotia as well. What we found is uh, we had nice green leaves holding on again, long, long duration of activity and uh, in Nova Scotia, particularly Brady, Brady, man, Brady Code, a few of you may know him, he uh, managed the, the research program for Eric out in Nova Scotia due to travel restrictions and also Brady just loving doing research trials. Uh, and he, he noted, you know, there was a lot of smalls left in the field because the grower went through and, and picked all, all the marketables and the bonuses and it wasn't worth their time picking up the smalls. That's how many uh, jumbos they got out of that field. So we're recommending, you know, with stem phyllium, we really, <laughs> it's not the easiest disease to control, right? And in, in, it comes in, it, you see it late in the field, just taking down your crop, but essentially it's almost, it's like apple scab, right? Where the primary inoculum occurs early in the season. Usually when you don't, you just finished up your herbicide sprays, you don't really feel like going out and spraying fungicides quite yet, but that's, that's really when you need to get out there to, to get first, first crack at stem phyllium. So, you know, there's other tools available for stem phyllium there. There's Quadris Top. Uh, there's other, other products from other competitors, which is good. There's lots of tools available. Um, and where does Miravis Duo fit in? And so we're saying to apply it during, during really that critical period in your onion crop. So at bulb initiation, then a second app, if you still have disease pressure later on at, at bulb development. Uh, this is where we're seeing the best benefit for Miravis Duo and that long lasting control we have. 
in carrots again we had we had several demos going out this time it was countrywide so we had alberta manitoba nova scotia ontario and quebec so we really got a lot of miravis duo sprayed out in carrots last year but first up uh to get the registration we have to have small plot data right so on the left hand side i have a bar chart and the first gray bar that's the amount of alternaria on the pedials and leaves themselves and you see we had crazy high pressure 50% uh, disease severity on your pedials, they're not going to be able to pull those carrots out of the ground to save your life, right? So, uh, whereas with the Miravis Duo, and in this case, we compared it to Quadris Top. So Miravis Duo is that, that blue bar, and Quadris Top is that green bar. We were getting 90% control of this crazy high disease severity in carrots, and this is from five trials that have been pooled together. So again, for registration purposes, we do these small plot trials where we spray the product over and over again, but then we want to get it in the hands of the growers. So like I said, last year we had it in five different provinces where Miravis Duo was used once or twice in, within the growers program to see the value of it. And you know, again, what we saw in carrots is that long duration of activity for foliar blights, and which is uh, really good news, and it held on that crop to improve harvestability, right? Because you know, as, as you lose your pedials, that's fewer pedials to grab on, on to pull them out of the ground. So again, uh, when it comes to Miravis Duo, where do we see it going down in the crop? And same as in onions, it's during that critical period for, for the development of that crop, which in carrots is, is root initiation and then shortly thereafter during root development where you're really bulking. And we recommend one to two sprays uh, during that, that period. Brassica or, or coal crops, what we saw this year is uh, that we control disease severity by over 90, 90% in these brassica crops. On the left hand side, again, registration trials where we sprayed Miravis Duo and compared it to Quadris with repeat applications. This is from four trials that we pooled together. The disease severity, that gray bar, was 20%, again, really high, because <laughs> we're assessing the, the amount of disease on the whole head, not just the number of heads infected, because we know in Brassica, if you have an infected broccoli head, you can't even ship it, right? So this is just severity, 20%, very high, whereas with Miravis Duo, again, we're seeing 90% control of that alternate area on the head. Last summer, uh, we had a demo site here in Ontario uh, with intentions of bringing people here, but you know, good intentions, not always come to fruition, but I got to go and check in on it uh, every couple of weeks. So we had a, a broccoli trial there. We were comparing Miravis Duo in a, within a spray program that had Bravo and Quadris Top as well. And we compared it to when we had the same program, but swapping out Fontellis. And what we saw, so we timed that Miravis Duo right at that head, head initiation timing. And what we saw at the end of the year is we had way more marketable heads from that Miravis duo. Essentially, every head in the row was marketable. Whereas with the Fontellis, we were closer to maybe 70, 60, 70% uh, could be sold. So again, the timing, like I hinted at just uh, on the previous slide, we really want to get in at that bud initiation or that head initiation period. That's when that the crop is really most vulnerable to its initial uh, alternary infection. And then if you continue having high pressure coming in again later during the vegetative stage. So switching gears. So that was Miravis Duo. Again, leaf spots, vegetables, powdery mildew, clear. <laughs> Miravis Prime, it's all about those difficult to control diseases. So this is all about sclerotinia, and botrytis. So here we have mixed with flutioxinol. So this is the active ingredient we currently have in switch. So if you go straw, if you grow strawberries, you're probably familiar with, with switch. Here on the screen are the crops that we have on the label. So we have lettuces, leafy greens and leafy pedials, which is celery, high bush blueberries, grapes and strawberries. So on the fruits, that's where we're targeting mostly botrytis. And on the lettuces, that's all about sclerotinia or sclerotinia drop, right? And you know, with sclerotinia drop, as soon as you get a head infected, the whole head, bottom of the head rots out on you. In this case, we have a, a dose rate. So we have in most crops, 0.32 to 0.4 liters per acre. 
favorable PHIs by that crop. So strawberries, you know, in those day neutral berries where you go in uh, rather quickly uh, after uh, to harvest repeatedly, uh, we have a one day PHI. And then in this case, no adjuvant is needed. One note about MRLs, if any of you grow low bush blueberries, we don't have export MRLs. So we're not promoting this product for use on low bush blueberries until we have those harmonized MRLs. But in the rest of the crops, high bush blueberries, strawberries and lettuces, we have harmonized MRLs with the US. So first up in lettuce, uh, the, the chart on the left hand side, again, registration trials, but with lettuce, you know, you, you time typically really early in the season and you make maybe two applications. So this is eight trials that have been pooled together. Uh, really high disease incidence. So again, that gray bar is the disease in, uh, incidence in this case. And we have almost 60% of the heads rotting out on us. Whereas Miravis Prime gave over 80% control. Early last year, we went down to Vero Beach to look at uh, some trials they had down there in Florida. That's our research site we have in Florida. And you can see with the Miravis Prime plots, every head is nice and healthy. Whereas with the untreated, it got completely smoked by sclerotinia. So even under this high of pressure, we're getting very good activity. Again, the timing. So there's two different uh, pathogens that cause sclerotinia drop, right? The main one is sclerotinia minor, which comes from the soil. Therefore, you need to protect the crop from the soil. This is why we recommend coming in shortly after transplanting with a Miravis Prime application. It's almost like a pre-emerge herbicide, right? Where you're spraying it on to that crop. So protecting those little leaves, as well as putting a hot layer on, on the soil itself. Thinning is in direct seeded lettuce, right? But if you go through and provide any kind of tillage on that bed, that's when we're recommending coming back with another application. Also, by spraying early, you're protecting those leaves that are eventually gonna to be touching the soil. And that again, will help them not get infected by sclerotinia. With strawberries, we had several demos last year uh, in Nova Scotia, Ontario, and in Quebec. Uh, we had quite a bit of fun doing this because, you know, first of all, strawberries are delicious. Uh, but we learned a lot too about the difference between day neutral and June bearing. Uh, what we had here is we, we included Miravis Prime in the grower spray program. The example we have on the screen was a demo we had in June bearing in Ontario. We had the same thing in Nova Scotia. Uh, and what we did is we just collected a couple of pints from uh, both the Miravis Prime program and the standard program and then graded out for the different fruit rots. So we had Botrytis and Anthracnose. So on the label currently, we only have Botrytis, but you know, we wanted fruit rot is fruit rot. <laughs> you don't want your fruit to be rotting. Um, but what we can see here on the screen is we just had way more berries, edible, uh, edible healthy berries in the Miravis Prime. Another example, what we did is when we collected those, those berries, we then stored them, all right? So our kitchens were all became laboratories last summer and we were storing them just at room temperature, worst case scenario, right? So when your berries get shipped to the grocery store, they're sitting there at room temperature on the shelf for, grow, for your, your, your customers to buy. Here, we just graded them out by healthy and rotten. And you can see in the Miravis Prime program, we had two different varieties and we had far more healthy berries than rotten berries. There was a varietal difference, but that is just the inherent susceptibility of those varieties to, to anthracnose and botrytis. So I'm gonna go through two examples, one being June bearing and the next being day neutral. In June bearing strawberries, we're recommending Miravis Prime is applied at that first bloom, that primary bloom in, in June bearing berries and then coming back later with your switch application. With day neutrals, you know, there's a few more applications that go down to protect against fruit rots. So the first application we recommend is again at that primary period. So that secondhand bloom, I understand that's what it's, what it's called. So essentially not the first bloom, but when you get that first cluster of blooms coming out, that's when you should paint on your, on your Miravis Prime. As you're continuously harvesting, we recommend a second application can be made, you know, if we're dealing with, with heavy pressure, high, high moisture in those berries, uh, a second application can be made during harvest, right, with that one day PHI. Going through quickly through a high bush blueberry example, um, 
On the left-hand side, this is actually low bush blueberry data where we compared Miravis prime to switch. So Botrytis incidence in the untreated, we had almost 50%, whereas in the, in the Miravis prime, we had almost 80% control. Last year, we had two uh, high bush blueberry demos out in BC, and we worked with a contract research company out there because we didn't have a rep yet, and we saw 11 to 13% higher yield with the Miravis prime than the standard program. Uh, that was quite shocking, <laughs> you know, with high bush blueberries to see 11 to 13% uh, higher yield. Uh, we, were, we were pretty shocked, but this was with two applications of Miravis Prime in the program. When to apply? Uh, we're recommending it come in at that early bloom, so just after pink. So your first Botrytis spray, we're recommending it be Miravis Prime, and then at full bloom, coming back with Switch. Switch is still Switch, right? So Switch is still, you know, a great Botrytis side, and it's about using all the tools you have available. And with that, Eric, I... Uh, I've rolled through everything, rambled on for quite a bit. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions coming through, uh, but I think we have a few minutes if, if there are. Yeah, thanks. We'll if probably go over to... Oh, Megan, yes. Go ahead, Megan. Oh, I was just saying we have a few minutes if anyone wants to ask any questions. Hi. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Miss, uh, would the uh, Miramis uh, dual would that be uh, uh, control the gray uh, white mold in uh, rutabagas? So, in uh, it would suppress white mold in rutabaga. Okay, so if you it was hard to probably notice, but we basically have half of the adepidin dose in Miravis duo. That's why we're not seeing a full level of control but it will help. Okay, Dwight? Okay, uh, what would be the best time for the, for the application? Again, you wanna get it on early there. So you wanna get with white mold in, in root crops, it's mainly getting it at the top of that crown, right? Or yeah. are you seeing it in storage? Seeing it in storage. Yeah, that's tricky. So again, you wanna get it covering the top of that crown uh, so whenever you can get up, depends on your seeding rate. So whenever you can optimally get coverage of that, that crown area is really when you should get it on there, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Jennifer or Eric? Oh, we have one in the chat. When do you hope this will be available for low bush blueberries and what is the cost per acre estimation? Yeah, so we have submitted for MRLs in Japan and Europe and, and we're currently talking to all the major processors to keep them up, up to date on the status of that. Uh, timelines are delayed in these countries because of COVID. Uh, so we're hoping, you know, two, three years from now is our estimated timelines currently. And Eric, you can you can talk about price. <laughs> I think until we get it registered for low bush, um, you know, we'll we'll hold on that question. But uh, you know, certainly I'd like to take the opportunity here to thank Truro Agamart for the for the opportunity for Jen and I to review our Miravis branded products. And I know. Certainly Nova Scotia's got a big initiative there for self-sufficiency on specialty hort. And it is exciting. Syngenta in the last two years stepped back, look at the hort market and we're committed and determined to bring uh, some of the best, best in class products uh, for you as growers to use on your, on your hort crops. So um, well, I'll leave it there, Megan, if there's any other questions that you guys determine the time, so. Uh, um... For grapes, I see two recommended applications on the label for prime. Does it interfere with action of biological control such as seraphil? Yeah, so for registration purposes, we have to show that it doesn't have activity against non-targets. Uh, and a lot of the biological control agents are similar to the non-targets, right? So we know that it doesn't interfere with um, that activity. It may the main thing to remember about grapes is we're in the process of registering this in Europe 
And if in Europe, if it does not go with biologicals, it's not a product that can be sold. So that, that's why I'm confident that we don't have interference with the biologicals. Perfect. Thank you, Jennifer and Eric for your time. And a big thanks to Syngenta for sponsoring the meeting today. Great. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, everyone. Thank have you. Have a good day. You too. All right, so up next, we have Dr. Kendra McClure and Dr. Sajid Raymond from Perennia. Uh, they're joining us today to provide an overview of fungicide resistance ma management. So if you're on, Kendra, you can start your presentation. Yes. Hi, I'm just going to uh, share my screen here, my presentation. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great. Try to move this video box over a bit. Okay, so yeah, um, good morning, everyone. And thanks for inviting us to speak today. Um, so today, myself and uh, my colleague, Sajid, um, we're going to talk about um, the, um, the Plant Health Lab at Perennia, which is where we both work. And the first half of the presentation, we're going to kind of give you a behind the scenes look at what we do at the Plant Health Lab. So I'll start off the presentation talking about the more molecular side of things, which is my area of focus. And then I'll switch over the presentation to Sajid and he'll talk about the more classical pathology diagnostic techniques, which is his area of specialty. And then at the end, uh, Sajid will cover the fungicide resistance management portion of the presentation. So we're gonna he be here for about an hour or so, or less than an hour. So I'll get the presentation started here. Um, so I think my understanding is that it's mostly um, horticulture crop growers here today. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, Perennia Food and Agriculture Inc, which is um, what we work for, but I'll just reiterate our vision for everyone. So our vision is to see Nova Scotia recognized as a world leader in producing innovative, environmentally responsible, safe food of impeccable quality. So to achieve that, um, our mission as an organization is to support the growth, transformation and economic development um, in Nova Scotia's agriculture, seafood and food and beverage sectors. So from our mission statement, you probably gleaned that um, Perennia has seen a lot of growth in the last few years and we've really broadened our scope. Our service areas represent agriculture and that's the, um, the area that Sajid and I work under, but we also offer um, quality and food safety services, product development, lab services, and fisheries. So we have a whole suite of, you know, commodity specialists for agriculture, but then we have other services as well. So um, if you're interested in any of these other services, you can contact myself or Sajid or our admin staff in uh, Kenville or Truro, and we can direct you to um, the particular service area that might help you with your particular um, concern. But today the focus is going to be um, the Plant Health Lab. Um, so it was um, established in uh, 2018 and um, it started off as um, um, providing virus screening services in the fall of 2018 for growers, but we've really grown uh, beyond that. And that's kind of the purpose of the presentation today is to show you everything that we can do. Um, and especially we, we really grew with our capacity when we hired a full-time plant pathologist on staff and that's Sajid. And he started in with Perennia in the fall of 2019. And really the vision of the Plant Health Lab is to provide a holistic local approach to growers pathogen problems. So you have myself, which can help you with the molecular diagnostic side of things. You have Sajid who can help you with the more classical plant pathology diagnostic side of things. So we can provide you with you know, diagnostic services, but you also have this whole suite of commodity specialists as well at your service where we can help you diagnose the problem and then try to mitigate that situation for you. And that's a really unique aspect of our offerings. So if you wanna learn more about the Plant Health Lab, um, you can go to Perennia's website. And if you scroll over to um, the lab services portion of the website and click on that, you can see it's very tiny, I'm sorry, but there's a Plant Health Lab tab. And if you click on that, it'll bring you to our website. We are in the process of updating it because it really just um, covers what we initially offered and we've expanded our services um, since then. So 
the website will be a little bit more informative um, in the coming uh, weeks and months. So I suggest you check back on that. But if you want to contact me, you can click on my image there. So like I mentioned, um, this first part of the presentation is really in two parts where we go over our specific um, niches within the plant health lab. So I'll start off. Um, so I'm Kendra, I take care of the molecular diagnostics and research side of things. Um, and that's my email address. And then Sajid takes care of the more classical plant pathology diagnostics and he'll take over halfway through. And that's our contact information. So what do I mean by molecular diagnostics and research? So some pathogens have a really, you know, hallmark um, exhibition of symptoms in the field. So um, by by just exhibiting that those symptoms, you can sometimes pretty accurately diagnose the problem. But sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, there's some viruses that, or there are some pathogens that can exhibit symptoms that look similar to other pathogens or other forms of abiotic and biotic stress that you see every day in the field. And that's the instance where you might want to seek out Sajid's help, where he can culture something out, look at it under the light microscope, and give you a diagnosis that way. But there's some pathogens such as viruses that are not discernible even under the light microscope. And they can also have symptoms that can mimic those stressors that I mentioned. Um, and that's the route where you might wanna go a different route. Um, and that's where you might wanna use some molecular biology techniques when you can't diagnose by eye. And there's other um, uses for these molecular biology techniques, not just pathogen detection, you can use them for species identification, all sorts of different things. Okay, so what do I mean about you know, those diagnoses that are a little bit trickier to do by eye. So this multi-paneled image here um, are all images of grapevine foliage. And the top panel, so pictures A, B, and C, these are grapevines that are infected with viruses. So A is grapevine red blotch virus, B is grapevine leaf roll associated virus three, and C is grapevine leaf roll associated virus one. So you can see that the symptoms across these different viruses could easily be mistaken for each other. And then if you look further in this multi-paneled image, you can see sources of abiotic and biotic stress that can, almost, that can also mimic the symptoms. So this is why you really kind of want to go the molecular approach to be sure of exactly what you're seeing, because it's very easy to mistake um, viruses for other sources of stress and vice versa. Um, this is a local um, example here. So these are pictures that were taken by our commodity specialists. And these are all examples of um, strawberry problems that we can see in the field. So on the upper left-hand corner, we have a strawberry field that's infected with a combination of strawberry mild yellow edge virus and strawberry model virus. So if you look at the foliage, you can see how it could easily be mistaken for something like um, nutrient deficiency or black root rot, like one of the images here, or even herbicide injury. So in this kind of instance, um, this is a situation where, you know, if you come to Perennial, we can provide, you know, pathology services, maybe the molecular approach, and also, you know, the specialty of our small fruit grower as well to, to try to figure out this problem for you and provide you with some potential mitigation options. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar with um, plant viruses, which will be uh, kind of a focus of this presentation, give you a little bit of background. So these, um, these pathogens are very small, but they're very mighty. One classic example from history is um, their involvement in the tulip mania that happened in the Netherlands in the 1600s. So these bulbs were really prized and coveted, especially these ones with this kind of breaking of the petals. And that actually was caused by a virus. <laughs> so they've been causing problems for hundreds of years. Um, so they are actually obligate parasites. And what I mean by that is that they need to infect host to survive and replicate. So what they do is they hijack the cellular machinery of host cells and they use that to, um, to produce proteins that are needed to survive and to also replicate their genetic information. And um, once they get in the cell, they actually spread cell to cell through the plasmata and then they can spread throughout the entire plant by getting into the vascular system. Um, beyond this single plant level, they can spread from plant to plant through vectors, such as um, things like nematodes, aphids, white flies, and they can also spread through vegetative propagation. So as horticulture crop growers, you're probably thinking, wow, okay, those are, you know, 
problems that we see and techniques that we use all the time. So they, are, they should be of concern. They can also present a range of symptoms and they can affect all sorts of different parts of the plants, such as leaves, flowers, roots, and stems. And they tend to be a concern for growers because they can result in reduced quality and yield. So the other image I have here is of a grapevine infected with grapevine red blotch virus. This is another virus we test for in the lab. And this virus causes um, reduced tonnage per acre, and then it also causes a reduction in berry quality. So you're getting less fruit off the vines, and the fruit that you're getting is of poor quality, and that's going to result in poor quality wine. So kind of a double whammy there. Now, some other um, commodities that are affected by viruses in Canada, um, some other viruses include tobacco mosaic virus, which is the first described um, plant virus, potato virus Y, plum pox virus, and tomato brown rugose fruit virus. So really, it, you know, viruses are an issue across commodities, um, and they should be kind of on the grower's radar. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about one of the viruses that we test for in the lab. Um, which is grapevine leaf roll associated virus. So there's several different types of this virus. We specifically test for one and three, and they can cause grapevine leaf roll disease. So this is a worldwide problem in grape growing regions, um, and it's been present in Nova Scotia since the mid 1990s. Um, some of the characteristic symptoms are a downward curling of leaves, but symptoms can really vary um, across different cultivars, red versus white berry cultivars, vinifera versus hybrids. So the symptoms, again, it's one of those examples that you can't really diagnose it just based on what you see in the field. Um, it can result in leaf discoloration, and then again, that reduction in yield and berry quality. And it's thought that it does this through disruption of the flow of the nutrients in the vascular system, particularly targeting the phloem cells. And there's no cure. So once a vine is infected, it's infected for life, which you know is a important consideration for growers that have these long, you know, long-lived perennial crops, such as, as as grapes. You know, you're putting that investment in the ground, and you're hoping to get 15, 20 plus years on that return on investment. And virus because viruses can really throw a wrench into that. So they're spread through infected material. Uh, and, uh, and vectors as well. And specifically the vectors associated with this virus are scale insects and mealy bugs. And some economists have looked at the numbers and they predicted severe economic losses over the lifespan of vineyards in uh, New York State, California, and Washington State. Okay, so I've given you a little bit of background on viruses and why they should be on your radar as um, pork crop growers. So I want to introduce one project that we've been working on the plant health lab and really it was kind of the jumping off point of the lab and which is a grapevine testing project. So this project started in the summer of 2018 and it's currently wrapping up and it was a provincially funded partnership with agriculture and agri-food Canada and perennial was tasked with testing material that was planted under the provincial expansion program. So we are interested in looking at newly planted vines and seeing if they're um, you know, coming in infected with viruses. And we targeted grapevine leaf roll associated virus one and three and grapevine red blotch virus. Okay, so how do we take samples when we wanna do virus testing? Um, you can think of it in, in a similar kind of manner to soil testing where um, you can't really rely on you know, a small subset of your field and, and extrapolating that you know, to the whole to the whole farm level. When you sample one vine, um, you really only get information for that one vine, right? Um, so what we suggest doing is doing something called composite samples, where you take five adjacent vines, take leaves from all those, and then pool them and test them together. And you get a little bit more bang for your buck. You're testing five at the same time. But really, if you want to get an idea of um, the infection level at a at the varietal block level, you want to sample the whole block. And what we suggest doing in that case is taking composite samples represented by um, these, these red squares in the image here and spreading those across and down your vineyard. And then that way you can get a more accurate idea of the infection level at the varietal block level. So what does that look like in the field? So I've got a cartoon here that's representing a composite sample. Generally, we think of that as the space between um, two trellis posts because they're easy to count and keep track of in the field. So what you would do is you would take five adjacent vines, take four leaves from each for a total of 20 vines, um, sandwich those all together, put them in a Ziploc bag with a unique sample ID on it, and then we can test those for you. But 
when you're sampling the leaves, there's a couple of things you want to keep in mind. You want to keep the pedials intact and you want to make sure you don't touch the pedials. I mentioned that the viruses target the vascular tissue. That's the part of the plant that we're testing for the viruses. So try not to touch those and try to keep them intact. Also, when you're sampling an individual vine, this is a bird's eye view that I've just added here. You want to think of, of sampling um, the leaves at the base of the, of the close to the trunk of the vine because those tend to be the older leaves and that's where we think the virus titers higher. And you want to collect throughout the canopy. So if you're facing your vine, you want to collect two from one side, then reach around through the trellising and go behind and pick two from the back and try to get them throughout the canopy. Don't target just one spur, for example. So this, as you can see from my frantic hand motions, <laughs> it's a bit hard to describe over Zoom. We have an instructional video on our website, so please check that out if you want to learn more. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about molecular testing. So for diagnoses that are not discernible by eye, if you can't see it, how do you know it's there? Well, what we do in the lab is we're testing for a genetic signature of the virus. We're testing for the presence of its genome, because if its genome's there, then we can assume that the virus is there and the vine is infected with the virus. And the molecular technique that we use to do that is called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. I'm not gonna talk about the specifics of PCR in this presentation. If you wanna learn more about it, please email me or call me on the phone and I can have a more in-depth conversation, but I'm gonna talk about just some broad concepts. So let's say that we have two samples of nice, healthy, asymptomatic leaves here, four leaves from each vine. We don't know what the vine status is, but because for the sake of this presentation though, I, I know that one is negative, so it doesn't have virus, and one is positive, so it has virus. So what we do is we use PCR to look for the genetic information from the virus in the positive sample. So remember, I don't know this, but I'll know it at the end because I'm detecting whether there's presence or absence of genetic information from the virus. So what I do with PCR is I take tissue from that leaf and I combine it with PCR reactions. So I do a chemical reaction. And what those reagents consist of, again, not super information or super important for you to know all the nitty gritty for this presentation, but it's all the enzymes basically that are required to make new genetic information. And it contains something called primers. And those are what target the actual genome of the virus. So for the sake of this presentation, think of PCR reagents as all the things you need to make new DNA molecules, just to copy them. That's all we're doing here. So what we do is we combine tissue from both samples in separate tubes with these reagents, and then we put them in a piece of machinery called a thermal cycler. And this is a this machine, it, it cycles through different temperatures repeatedly. And this changes the conformation of the genetic information that's present in that little tube so that it can interact with those molecules. And we can make copies of the genetic information that's there if it's present. And that's a caveat here, right? Because at the end, we're going to do an assay to look for presence or absence of those, of those copies of that genetic information that's being made. So in the negative sample, there was no viral DNA to begin with, sorry, RNA to begin with. Nothing got amplified in the reaction. So at the end point, it's negative. In the positive sample, it did amplify because it was present. And we made many, many, many copies of that. And now we're able to detect it using an assay. That's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. But like I said, if you want to learn more, don't hesitate to contact me. Okay, so where are we at with the grapevine testing project? We're wrapping up and we found that new plantings in Nova Scotia are infected with these viruses. They have grapevine info associated virus one, three and grapevine red blotch virus. And we can comfortably say that because these plantings are brand new, the material is coming in or being disseminated through the province already infected. By the end of the project, we'll have indexed nearly 10,000 vines. So we have information across um, all the grape growing counties in the province. Um, and I should state that the growers participating in this, in this project, all the information is confidential, um, but we have an idea across different cultivars in vinifera versus hybrids, what the disease incidence is. So now we have this information and we can look back, you know, in the future, if, if some problems arise, we can, we can reference this information to see if things line up with um, presence or absence of virus. But more importantly, now we have this local testing option available for growers. So we can make faster, more informed decisions. So uh, I should state that with this grapevine project, 
we've been sampling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vines. So it takes us a while to get through that material and we tend to give those results back to participating growers around this time of year. But if you as a grower have an you know, emergency situation where you wanna find out the status of your vines and you drop off samples to us, you know, we are able to turn around those results to you in a few days or a few weeks. So we can really help you make that fast informed decision. And don't forget that you know you don't just have these virus results. You also have this team of specialists behind you at Aprenia that can help you um, mitigate that problem. So don't hesitate to reach out. So future work, where are we going with this molecular work? Like I said, the grapevine virus testing project, it's wrapping up, but we're looking to expand into different commodities. And one of the first targets is strawberries and cane berries. And we're working on that at the moment doing PCR um, testing, and then hoping to expand in other type of molecular testing, such as ELISA. You've probably heard of PCR and ELISA in the news lately. It's a similar type of testing that's available for doing coronavirus testing. Um, but keep in mind that you know, developing new offerings, it takes time, it takes money, it takes a lot of experimentation, and a lot of verification as well, so that we're sure of what we're doing. So, um, but that in mind, you know, if you as a grower are aware of a pest or pathogen that's emerging that you think is of concern, don't hesitate to contact us. We're always looking for feedback. You know, we're here to serve you and we want to make sure that what we're doing is applicable to you and your kind of real, real world, real world situation. So with that, I'll, um, I'll switch it over to Sajid, but um, please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any more questions probably wait till the end of this portion to receive questions. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my contact information. And thanks so much for letting me speak today. Great, thanks Kendra. So Sajid starting now. Can you can you hear me? Can you see my presentation? I think you've got on presenter mode, Sajid. Or we're seeing oh. presenter mode. So you might want to unplug your monitor if you have an external monitor. Oh, okay. And maybe exit out and then try uh, loading it again. Okay. Should be fine. Um, it's still the presenter mode. Okay. There you go. Okay, sorry for the delay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sometimes this technology thing is a little bit complicated. <laughs> um, Okay, so I will just give you a, a workflow of uh, what I, I I do at Plant Health Lab at Perinia. Uh, so once I, uh, when I receive the samples, so most of the samples are symptomless uh, the, because I, for the diagnosis, I need that uh, uh, fungus is out and then I can see its morphological features. Most of the uh, uh, samples, they don't have any any fungal growth on them. So first step is that once the sample is delivered, uh, I do visual observations and note it down. 
and then so that I can narrow it down to 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 couple of uh, suspects. And then uh, I incubate most of the samples that incubate it under humid conditions. For example, in this case, uh, you can see apples and then garlics. Uh, the incubation time, it, it depends on the pathogen. Uh, it, it can come out between four and seven days. Uh, if it is not, sometimes we have immuno strips, so we can test some of the pathogens uh, with those strips and it, they give also a very quick and reliable uh, diagnosis. And once the pathogen is out, I can I observe it, observe them under stereo microscope and compound microscope uh, to reach out the conclusion about the causal organism. In in in, in some cases, I, I need to plate out the the, path, the the sample. For example, in this case, this is a I received a sample of Dutch alum disease. So you can see in the middle panel with the, with the arrow that uh, it's only when I peel off the surface, I can only see a brownish tissue, but it does not tell me anything. So then I uh, surface sterilize it under, under sterile conditions and put it on, the, uh, on selective media. And after five to seven days, I can observe the fungal reproductive structures under the microscope, which confirms the presence of Dutch alum disease in this tree. This is the example of a strawberry sample. Uh, the, it, it was infected with verticillium and uh, after, after surface sterilization and incubation, incubating it for five to seven days, I could see a verticillium coming out of the xylem vessels specifically, which confirms the presence of verticillium. Uh, then I can also observe, I also observed um, in, in black root rot infected roots, rhizoctonia. You can see this, uh, the, the, this, high, the, the, this pathogen, it has the hyphae which, has, which is branching at right angle, which confirms the presence of rhizoctonia in the strawberry plants. In this example, uh, it is the when the sample was received on, so it, I, I have indicated the timeline. So at zero days, uh, it, there was, I could not see anything. So after incubation for seven days and 11 days, you can see the fungus started coming out and then I could observe it under the microscope, the it's conidia, and then uh, I could confirm uh, the causal organism. This is an example of black root rot. Uh, Oh, disease of strawberry. The when I received the roots, so they look like this. So I cannot see. I have to make the microscopic observations right away. Uh, in this example, uh, I have indicated a oospore of Pythium species with this black arrow, and then I also found Rhizoctonia. So those two uh, causal organisms are present, and they cause uh, the black root rot uh, disease of strawberry. And nematodes are also important players in it. Uh, the apple samples, I received apple samples and uh, uh, it was just, uh, nothing was visible, only those specks on the on the calyx side. And later I found out that it was uh, infected with the San Joe scale. Uh, the, these pictures, you can see it very clearly, the scale of the San Joe scale. And then here, these are the nymphs. In this example, uh, spinach, uh, the leaves, they were infected with powdery mildew and microscopic because the pathogen was already out. And then I, uh, when I made the slide uh, and observed it under the compound microscope, I could, I could confirm the, the pathogen, which was spinach powdery mildew. Uh, I, the one sample I received about, was about cabbage. It was suspected that it's infected with black spot, but there was nothing uh, visible on the, on, the, on, the, on the infected tissue. But when I incubated it for a couple of days, then you can see the sporulation uh, on the tissue. And then uh, when I made the slide, and I could confirm based on the conidia morphology, the causal organism. Uh, some of the guidelines for when you are submitting sample for plant disease diagnostics. Uh, briefly, uh, whenever you submit the sample, please describe briefly the problem or symptom, uh, because it really helped help me in narrow down the suspects. A sample should be representative of the 
symptoms observed in the field. It should uh, select samples that are still alive uh, with visible symptoms. Dead or dying tissue should not be sampled because many secondary pathogen microorganisms, they start growing in the dead tissue and then which makes the diagnosis very complicated. Plants should be, if you want to submit uh, root, uh, root tissue, so you should dug up the whole plant so that uh, the, the root system stay intact and then I can observe it. Be sure to collect the uh, sample prior to pesticide application because if you will submit something after pesticide application, then the fungus will not come out of the tissue and I cannot culture it. Or wrap the plant or plant parts in a paper towel and enclose it in a plastic bag so that the sample does not dry out. Because if it is it's dry out, then the, the maybe the, the pathogen is already dead. Be sure and also uh, remove the excess soil. If you want to submit soil sample, then you should do it in a separate bag. Specimen should be fresh. If a sample cannot be mailed immediately, keep it at four degrees in the, in the refrigerator it will slow down the uh, growth of the secondary organisms and also uh, the causal organism will be still alive. Pack the samples securely uh, in a carton box or, or styrofoam box and mail it or drop it, drop it off. Uh, if possible, you can choose the fastest uh, method to deliver the sample. If you will uh, send the sample early in the week, then it will then I can observe it in the same week and it will not have any delay. Uh, if dropping the sample, if you want to drop the samples off in person, uh, you, can, you can contact me, uh, notify me, uh, or there is a collection cooler outside the building where you can drop off your sample anytime. The drop off hours are normally, uh, the, the collection cooler is outside from 8 to 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Monday to Friday, and then I, I check it, um, uh, multiple times during the day. Sh uh, shipping samples immediately after sampling is the best option. If you want to store them, you can store it at at, ref at four to 10 degrees un until they are shipped, but do not freeze your samples because it will, uh, uh, it can kill the pathogen. So regarding nematodes, this is a new, new service line. Uh, here in this picture, I just displayed different kinds of nematodes uh, and uh, and it's very complicated to, to identify them. Just, it, seems, it, it seems very simple with the pictures, but, uh, but it's not that easy. Uh, when, so when, when we, I'm analyzing the sample, so uh, this is just workflow that uh, uh, assess, if you, uh, if you think that your crop has been damaged by nematodes, so, so you should collect the soil sample, soil and tissue sample. And then once I have them, I extract the nematodes from the sample, I identify the nematodes, and then I know the population density of the nematodes in the sample, and uh, and then nematode damage analysis can be done. So I can say that uh, if 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 it, it has reached the economic threshold for where treatment is a necessity or not. So you can do management decisions based on the nematode species identification. For example, if you want to manage them with with cover crops. In this example, I have included carrots which were infected with different species of uh, parasitic nematodes on the on the on the on the extreme left panel. The roots, uh, the nematode, the carrots were infected with the cyst nematode. So the in case of cyst nematode and root node nematodes, you can see that those both nematodes they induce the formation of secondary fine roots, and then the tap root formation is inhibited. In case of root lesion nematode, root forking forking is obvious. When you want to collect soil sample for the nematodes, uh, you should follow a consistent pattern. If your field uh, area is uh, is very small, it's less than a uh, hectare, you can do random sampling as indicated here. But uh, as you should understand that the nematode population is not homogeneously distributed in the field. So you should do a systematic sampling. You should follow a pattern of sampling as indicated in, this, uh, in these diagrams. Uh, in general, uh, 10 to 50 uh, subsamples should be collected with an, with an auger uh, till at a depth of at least uh, 15 to 20 centimeter. Once you collect all those uh, individual samples, you can bulk them in, the, in, 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 a, in a bin or in a, 
in a container and then you mix it and a composite sample of one, one to two kilogram of soil from that field can be submitted for, for analysis. In case of roots, 25 to 100 gram of root sample is enough. Once you have the sample, you should label, label it from the outside with a, with a permanent marker and then place the sample uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in an insulated container. Some more general guidelines in amateur, as I mentioned that uh, amateur populations are not evenly distributed in the field. So it is very important that you follow a consistent, consistent sampling pattern. Otherwise, uh, the economic thresholds which will be uh, determined, it, they will be, there will be huge variation and maybe it will not reflect actual situation in the field. Uh, uh, a composite sample, I already told you that a composite sample of one to two kilogram of soil should be submitted. Uh, and uh, the soil sample, uh, so it sh should be put in a, in a shade because nematodes are very delicate uh, organisms and they, we can, they can be killed easily if we expose them to heat. The root sample, if you want, if you are submitting roots sample for analysis, it should, it should be with soil. Otherwise the roots will desiccate and nematodes can die. And then with the extraction methods, the if dead nematodes can, will not come out of the plant tissue. In case of annual crops, a uh, soil sample uh, should be taken just before or after harvest. But in case of perennials, for example, in case of apple orchards or a strawberry, a sample, a soil sample should be taken during the growing season when the plant is actively growing. Because when the plant is growing, nematode is also, uh, nematode population will also increase. The nematode population tends to drop during fall and early spring. Uh, if you have any question and comments, you can always contact me at uh, my phone number or my email address. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you both. Is there any questions for Kendra or Sajid? We're a little ahead of schedule, so there's lots of time for questions if you wanna put one in the chat box. I think Sajid will cover the fungicide resistance management portion after the questions, but yeah. Oh, okay. If there's any questions about our two first parts of our presentations. Okay. Shall I start the next presentation? If there are no more questions. Yeah, yeah, go for it. And, oh, we do have it. We do have a question. It's up to you if you want to do this first or do the question. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, we can address the questions for this part now. Okay. Uh, the question is: Are the labs able to test for soil-borne disease? Yes. And we did have another one come in. Are there thoughts about doing some baseline assessments of nematode present across the valley? This is directed to Sajid. Um, yes, uh, we, uh, at the moment for, the, for Nova Scotia, there is no information about it, like the, the, the species, species diversity uh, across the valley, but there, there's a plan, there's a, there is a project which is proposed to work on this aspect. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, we'll you can go ahead with your uh, presentation, and we'll address any other questions afterwards. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I have shared my screen, so I think you can see the uh, see my presentation, right? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Okay. So I will. So for this part of the uh, presentation, I will be uh, focusing on the fungicide resistance management. Uh, during this presentation, I will introduce you to some basic terminology. Uh, and and then followed by the means which which fungicides are at risk uh, of of, uh, of of fungicide resistance and then how we can manage it. So to, so to start with uh, with the, with the fungicides, fungicides are class of pesticides which are used to prevent the growth and penetration of disease causing fungi and fungi like organisms. Uh, there is a high cost associated with the development of fungicides. For example, nowadays, it's, it, uh, company, it's need, any agro agrochemical company needs 
300 million dollars to register a product. Uh, so, and few and the few active ingredients have been registered uh, now in the beginning uh, of the of, of the like last in the beginning of last century. The uh, introduction of the new active ingredients were were like more like exponential phase. Many many active ingredients were put in the market, but now for the last two decades, only two classes of fungicides uh, were were registered. Uh, fungicides should be used uh, very prudently because many of the fungicides have been removed from the market because of their impact on the environment. And now new chemistries are more effective and more specific. And new, those new chemistries are very effective at low rates. This can be uh, I, this can be shown in the in this graph. So this graph is from US. Uh, the the use of fungicides uh, in million pounds per year. Uh, starting from 1944, you can see that it was like around 300 million pounds. But now in 2002, it has reduced to one third. It's just over 100 pound, million pounds per year. So you can imagine that. Uh, the, the new chemistries are very effective and very specific, and but the, there is more chance of resistance development as well. The nematodes, uh, the sorry, uh, the fungicides, they can be classified in two ways. Uh, first is based on their mobility, uh, and based on their mode of action. In case of mode of action, it is the cellular process which is inhibited by the fungicide. For example, respiration or cytoskeleton or cell membrane. And the site of action is the a specific target uh, enzyme, which is targeted by that fungicide. So this is different than mode of action. So mode of action can be in mitochondria, for example, in respiration. But then there is a specific enzyme in the mitochondria, which is which defines the site of action. In case of mobility, uh, fungicides can be. Uh, can be classified into contact, systemic, or mesosystemic fungicides. I will I will go deeper uh, for for each of them in the coming slide. So in case of contact fungicide, uh, the, the the fungicide. So you can see the it's it's indicated as a droplet on the left panel. Uh, in case of contact fungicide, the fungicide remains on the leaf surface. It does not penetrate in the leaf, and and it will and it will it will only cover wherever that contact fungicide is present, then if the, if the, if the pathogen will make in contact with that fungicide, then the uh, development of that pathogen will be disrupted. Otherwise, it will not affect the pathogen. It must be applied uh, before disease uh, penetration and uh, it, its activity is mostly seven to 10 days depending on the rain and irrigation because it is present only on the leaf surface if there, will, there is a rain or there is a, you, you, supply, you apply sprinkler irrigation, then the effect will be diluted because most of the fungicide will go into in the ground. In case of mesosystemic fungicides, the, these fungicides once applied, they are locally systemic. So it means it, they just penetrate few cell layers in the cell in, on, the, on, the, on the leaf as indicated in this diagram. Um, and, and it moves to untreated surfaces, but to a shorter distance only. So in, in general, if you apply it as a foliar application, then it has translaminar mode of action. And uh, the effectivity period is between a 14 to 28 days based on the pathogen and the environment. A truly systemic fungicide, if you apply as a foliar application or in the roots, it will, it will move through xylem and phloem to, to all parts of the plant. And it requires actively growing plant parts. It has a, it, it's curative in function because it can reach everywhere and it can inhibit the, uh, the development of the disease. The effect, the, it, 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 the protection period is the same as mesosystemic fungicides 14 to 28 days. The mesosystemic and systemic fungicides, they are more selective than contact fungicides. In this complex example, it, this is just the, uh, the, the classification of the fungicides based on their mode of action. Uh, in this case, uh, the, this is the fung fungi, the, the cell of a fungi, and then different uh, compartments in the cell has, have been highlighted. Different fungicide, for example, uh, the, in case of uh, mitochondrial respiration, so this group, uh, Cunin I outside inhibitor and uh, SDHI, they, 
they target micro microchondrial respiration, which is indicated here in black dots. Then uh, one of the MBC class, it targets beta tubulin, which are, this, uh, which are the important components of cytoskeleton in the cell. Uh, SBI, uh, the strobilurins, the they, they, they target a specific enzyme in the cell membrane. And, and uh, uh, PA class of the fungicides, they target RNA biosynthesis in the nucleus of the cell. And uh, the cell wall biosynthesis and carboxylic acid amides, those fungicides, they target chitin synthase. It's an enzyme in, in, involved in the cell wall. And then uh, we have uh, uh, another one, another single site uh, uh, fungicide, which is, which is, which is uh, which involves, which blocks the amino acid biosynthesis, which is AP. So these are, uh, uh, most of them, they are single site uh, fungicides, which have this, I described just now. Uh, there are also multi-site uh, fungicides. So those fungicides, they target more than one cellular process. That's why they are called multi-site. And the frag group, they are, their frag group is with M. Then we also have plant defense inducers, which is which has a, a frac code of P. So these are the microbial or biochemical elicitors of plant defense. So if you apply them, then it induces the plant resistance to a following infection with the pathogen. With this information, uh, we can read the, uh, this, it will help in, in reading the label. For example, in this case, uh, propiconazole, it is the, it is the, it is the name of the active ingredient. Then it is marketed with different trade names, tilt, jade, bumper, and topaz. The mode of action, the, the cellular function, which it is disturbs is the sterol, sterol biosynthesis in membranes. Then its side of action is a specific enzyme, which is called C14D methylase. So it's a single site fungicide, which is targeting only one site, one enzyme. And it belongs to FRAC group three. And this gr group name, it indicates what all the fungicides in that group they, they do. So for example, they are demethylation inhibitors of that enzyme. The it belongs to chemical group of triazoles and its common name is propiconazole. When we want to understand the uh, fungicide uh, resistance risk, so it is not only the different components, they play important role in fungicide resistance development not only the fungicide, but also the pathogen biology, and then agronomic practices also play important role uh, in, in fungicide resistance development. I will address them one by one now. So in case of uh, fungicide resistance, so it's the fungicide resistance is that the insensitivity of fungal uh, isolates to a, to a fungicide. In this uh, example, in this uh, uh, in this diagram, you can see that there are on the left side there are many uh, blue uh, circles. So th this represents the the situation in the field, uh, and then uh, these these are the wild type individuals of a pathogen, and then we have also the red dots, which are the which are the mutated ones. So the mutation. Uh, because you know that the pathogen has been in the field for 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 many years, so in the in, during the growing season, so then by 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 natural uh, recombination there are mutants, which have which have though the fungicide does not induce that mutation, but fungicide helps in the selection of those mutant individuals over time. So in this case, the red in, red ones, they have the mutated target site in them. But if we, if we use the same fungicide from the same group repeatedly, so you can see that the frequency of mutant individuals is increasing over time. And by the time we reach to the fourth block, so you can see there is now the frequency of the mutant individuals are much higher than the wild type. This we call is as practical resistance when when you will apply that, fungi if you will apply that fungicide again, this will be, you will not see any efficacy of that product. That's why, so the fungicide, what it is doing is that the mutations are already present in nature, but fungicide is selecting the mutant individuals. Uh, 
the, the, the resistance of the fungicides can be qualitative or uh, quantitative. So qualitative is a single step. So as I as I told you that single site fungicide they target on one, only one enzyme, one site. So when there is a one mutation, then that uh, fungicide they cannot bind to the enzyme and then it is ineffective. So in the first case, you can see the the, the sensitivity was very high to that fun, that fungicide, but due to mutation during like within a one one cropping season or the next cropping season, then suddenly you see that it became highly resistant because of the frequency of the mutant individuals, they become very high in the field. In case of multi, in quantitative resistance is called also multi-step resistance because there are many target sites in the same enzyme or so some of the fungicides, they target more than one uh, target site. And then the built up of resistance is over time. So the incense, so then if, for example, if there are four or five mutations are needed. So they don't come like they, 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 don't, they don't originate only once. So they, they do it over time. That's why you see that the, there is a, so that in the, in the beginning, in case when the sensitivity was very high, so then, then the fungicide resistance was low, but slowly, slowly you have the accumulation of those mutations in the population and which makes them uh, insensitive to that fungicide and because you have to apply high dosage of the same active ingredient to have an effective control. That's why it is called multi-step uh, resistance. Then there is a phenomenon is called cross resistance. For example, um, in case of uh, here, I have highlighted uh, one example. So here's a group 11, so which is, uh, which is frag, good, frag, frag code 11 fungicides, they target mode of action is the respiration. So they target mitochondria. So this is a specific enzyme. The target site is uh, uh, cytochrome BC, complex three enzyme, but what if one, if you are using that fungicide again and again, <coughs> so if you, if, <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so if, if you are repeating, so it doesn't matter which product you will use in the same code. So if all code, so if here is 11, so if you use, for example, this product, so then, so then it, if fungicides, if the, if the fungal, individuals, they have developed resistance to one of the product. So it will be, there will be cross, cross resistance observed to all the products in the same frag code. So that's why uh, this, those single site of fungicides, they are at high risk of, of, uh, of, of resistance development. There's another kind which is called multi-drug resistance. In this case, the, the fungal, the fungi or the pathogen, the, it becomes insensitive to uh, fungicides with more than one mode of action. So this is called multidrug resistance, but it will be uh, more clear in this animate animation. So this is the mechanism of fungicide resistance. So this is a hypothetical cell. And then this red uh, triangle, this is the fungicide. And uh, the, the, the blue uh, circle, it is the, 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 the target site, for example, an enzyme in the, in the fungi. So what the fungicide is doing is it is mim mimicking this natural substrate which is present in the in the in the in the cell. But this fungicide it is a it, this this presents a lock and key mechanism. So the so the lock here is the enzyme which is blue and the key is the red one. And once it, there is a perfect match, so then the it, the the fungicide to so that cellular process will be inhibited and the fungi will not be able to. To, to develop or, or penetrate. But when, uh, when it has developed resistance, so one of the mechanisms is the altered target site. So in this case, the fungi enzyme, the, the enzyme, the lock, the, the blue one, it, 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 there is a point mutation and then it is not allowing the, the, the red, the, the fungicide to fit in. So in this way, the, then this will render that, uh, that fungal uh, individual uh, resistant to the fungicide. There's another uh, process which is called detoxification. The, once the fungicide is applied, it comes into the cell, but uh, the pathogen has developed uh, the, it has the enzymes which can break it down or, or catalyze, catalyze it into, uh, into no, to not harmful form, which is called detoxification. 
Uh, another another uh, mechanism is the target site overexpression. As I told you, that fungicides they are the analogs of natural substrate, which is which exists in the cells. But when there is more target site, even the fungicide is uh, there is a lock and key mechanism. Even fungicide is binding with the target enzyme, but the enzyme produces so much that the natural substrate can also bind. To the uh, uh, to the enzyme, so that it will not affect. It will only reduce the activity, enzymatic activity. But the 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 fungus, the, the fungus, it will still live. In case of multi-drug resistance, here I have uh, in, uh, uh, indicated a different color codes. They indicate uh, fungicides with different mode of actions, like red, green, and and uh, and, uh, and 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 yellow. And once they are in, they are inside the cell. There are the pumps, which so one of them is ABC transporters. So they are membrane-bound pumps, which are indicated in purple here. So so do, so they, uh, they they indiscriminately they they just pump the uh, fungicides out of the cell, irrespective of their mode of action. Once this uh, once a pathogen has developed this, so it is very difficult to control it. So best example is botrytis uh, gray mold. It has multi-drug, it has developed multi-drug resistance to, to different uh, fungicides. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, I am just giving you an example of the, uh, of the, of the uh, different diseases of the uh, of different fungicides which are used in Apple production system. And there are uh, the frac codes uh, have been indicated, and then the resistance resistance risk associated with them also has been also indicated. As you can see, that the single site fungicides, frac group one, eleven, twenty five, they are at high risk of resistance development because a single change in mutation, a single mutation can can render that fungicide ineffective. And if you come to the bottom, there is a M. Uh, uh, the, there is also multi-site fungicide, and it has a low resistance risk because the fungus, the fungal pathogen, has to mutate many target sites within its gene genome, which is not possible, or the chances are very, very less. So, uh, some of the, uh, the so for, as I showed you the 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 triangle before, so the the pathogen biology it also plays an important role. In fungicide resistance development, there are different factors of pathogen biology. For example, number of generations. Uh, it depends if a pathogen is monocyclic or polycyclic. So monocyclic pathogens, they only are, they have one generation per year only. So the example is the smut in case of wheat and Dutch alum disease. But there are also polycyclic uh, uh, disease, uh, pathogens. For, they produce more than one generation in a year. So there, if there will more spore production more chances of having mutation. And then if you apply the fungicide, then there will be more selection of those mutant uh, individuals. So the example is powdery mildew and rusts. Then the mode of uh, reproduction, sexual or asexual reproduction. So if you have, if they have, a, if they have sexual reproduction, so then there will be more, the gametes from opposite sex will, the, will, re, will, they will, they will combine with each other and then there will be recombination events in the in the chromosomes, and then new combinations will arise, which can give so those pathogens which have sexual stage, in general they have they have high risk of path, of fungicide resistance development. For example, uh, but but it does not is not completely true. Some of the uh, pathogens, for example, powdery mildew, it it, it is reproducing uh, asexually, but it is uh, and and for example downy mildew. In cooker weeds, it has also it's reproducing asexually mostly because sexual stage has not been recorded yet. So it has, so it has high uh, risk of resistance development. Then the fitness score. So as I showed you before, that if you have have a mutant individual in a population, it has also fitness cost to that mutant individual because he has to compete with the wild type individuals which are present at large in the field. So every Every mutation does not lead to fungicide resistance. Some of the mutations will be lethal to that pathogen, and then that uh, I, that that individual will not be able to compete with the wild type, and it will be eliminated uh, as uh, uh, from the from the race. 
but if if we if we use the fungicides and then we select only for that uh, type of uh, wild type of, of the mutant type then it will have advantage over wild type which is sensitive to the fungicide the third factor is resistance development history some of the diseases they have a uh, they are they are notorious for uh, fungicide resistance development for example uh, in case uh, cooker beet downy mildew apple scab cercospora leaf spot of sugar beet strawberry and thracnose and botrytis gray mold those pathogens are at high risk of fungicide resistance development then the fifth component is the dispersal mechanism some of the pathogens if they if they if the inoculum they can be transported with air wind currents so then they can be spread on longer uh, on longer they can be spread on longer distances and so you can consider that the farmers they are using different fungicides uh, and then they will be exposed to to multiple fungicides at at the same time of, at same time but at different places so then they will have more risk of resistance development uh, the best example is powdery mildew downy mildew and rust because they are in oculum it is wind wind borne uh, uh, in contrary uh, soil borne diseases they are at low risk of resistance development for example rhizoctonia and nematodes because they are in the soil so they, they unless hum, with the human activities when you are cultivating the, the land then you transport that uh, source of inoculum into the other field so the so the speed of the spread of the pathogen is really very slow so uh, these are the uh, these are the, these are the uh, frac codes of uh, of the sum of the uh, so these are so the the frac it stands for fungicide resistance action committee is a world body which monitors the fungicide resistance uh, development in different parts of the world to, against different pathogens so they publish every year a list of the pathogens which are at risk of fungicide development in this case th this is just a small list you can find more information from their website uh, I, i have highlighted in blue uh, sub uh, three pathogens like you can see they are all botrytis and uh, uh, and they have high risk of uh, of uh, those diseases they are at high risk of fungicide resistance development um here the example of uh, i'm i'm mentioning the apple uh, the example of the apple diseases some of the apple diseases for example apple scab and gray mold that they are at high risk of resistance development and and like uh, the others i have medium to high uh, Uh, color rot and bitter rot they are they, they are considered medium risk but sooty blotch and fly speck black rot they are considered low risk uh, diseases so when you combine the 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 disease risk and fungicide risk so then it 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 generates a matrix which can help you in use of the fungicides So, for example, in this case, the fungicide risk on the on the on the x-axis, you have the fungicide risk. It is indicated. It has a scale of one to three. One is the low lowest, uh, and the three is the highest risk. Similarly, in, on the y-axis, we have the disease risk. Uh, different diseases of the apple are mentioned here, and then they are also classified. They are given score of one, two, or three based on their uh, their their risk level. and you can see that even uh, even uh, a, a disease is high risk you can manage it with a low risk fungicide and uh, for example if you will use uh, uh, a high high risk uh, fungicide for example pristine a group 11 for example in this case against uh, against a disease like uh, apple scab or gray mold which has uh, which are considered uh, high risk pathogens so then there will be then you will have uh, also higher chances of resistance development to these diseases against those fungicides regarding fungicide resistance management the uh, the, the the fungicide resistance action committee recommends those following points uh first one is do not use the same product exclusively so you we should rotate frac groups restrict the number of applications per frac group per season apply preventatively instead of eradicative use of the fungicides so maintain manufacturer's uh, recommended dose ensure correct water so the sprayer should be well calibrated when you are applying the fungicide and then integrated disease management i will come back to them one by one now 
so uh, the first is the rotate uh, uh, frag uh, rotate the frag groups so as i uh, as i showed you before that you should not rotate the products but the the frag groups with different mode of action <coughs> for example for example the uh, the, the frag committee they recommend for group 7 uh, if you want to use it as a solo so you should apply a maximum 3 uh, you you so you should, you can apply uh, sdhi fungicides you should apply in strict alternation with fungicide with different cross cross resistance groups so don't use the same product from group 7 again and again and if you want to put as a mixtures you can put maximum of two consecutive applications in case of group 11 for example strobilurens uh, so do not use consecutive application of of uh, of strobilurens for example in case of cucurbit powdery mildew it is not recommended to use it more than once in this diagram it is just uh, the, uh, the the pattern of use of a of a group group of fungicide for example in this case in the in the first bar so if we are using the same product again and again repeatedly three times a a a then there is a there is a high risk of resistance development but if we rotate it with the for example b b is a multi site fungicide the resistance risk is will be little bit is bit will be medium but when if we will rotate it with different uh, fungicide with different mode of action for example a b and c the then we are lowering the risk of the fungicide resistance development and then a uh, uh, rotate rotation of the of the frag groups as i if you are using using a using a tank tank mix for example so we we mix the uh, uh, two fungicides with different mode of actions the care should be taken that both active ingredients should be effective on the target pathogen uh sometimes we mix the fungicides also to broaden its spectrum to control more than one pathogen at the same time uh the, the best practice is to use a uh, group m fungicide which is a multi site because the chances of getting resistance is low uh when you will mix it with a single site fungicide so the single site will take care of the target pathogen but the the group m fungicide it will take care of the mutant population uh you can use also biologicals uh, or or plant defense inducers because they are also multi, they are considered also multi site fungicides so uh, as i mentioned two single site fungicides with different mode of action should be mixed in this example if you can see that even if you are using a mixture of a b and you are using it repeatedly again and again it is not a good practice so you should rotate it with the with the with the different with the fungicide with different mode of action or if you want to use it as a mixture you can use it uh, you can mix it with the different uh, the fungicide with different mode of actions as indicated here so you should restrict the number of application per frag group per, per season limit the application of products with the same frag group as i mentioned i already discussed before and frag as you can see the latest recommendation from the fungicide resistant action committee uh, website in this case i have highlighted two examples for example for stone fruit a frac recommends that application of a maximum of 3 sdhi containing products per year even if it includes the application in the mixture for for palm fruit uh, a frac recommends application of maximum 3 uh, strobilurin uh, containing products per year uh app, apply, apply preventatively instead of eradicative use it means that uh if if we should apply the fungicide before the onset of the disease if we apply the fungicide when the uh, when when more, lot of the plants are already heavily infected with the disease then we are in if we are putting selection pressure uh, on the on the on the uh, on the pathogen and there will be lot of mutant individuals left in the end because when you will do the eradicative use it will put more uh, stringent selection pressure on those mutant individuals uh, in this case disease forecasting models with they are best resource because you can predict they can predict the onset of a disease if the environment is conducive to the disease or not for example uh, mary blight for fire blight is a model for to predict the fire blight and growth can spray in advance if you will apply preventatively then the there will be less spores will be produced from that pathogen 
maintain uh, manufacturers uh, dose because if you will apply uh, if you think that the, the disease risk is low but you apply uh, a low dose of the fungicide so those sub lethal uh, doses will have the uh, will 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 result in the resistance development in the target fungicide over time and if you will if you are using if you are if you if you are observing that you are you, you are using high rates then the label says and that for to achieve an effective control it means the resistance has already developed in the population <coughs> the last point is uh, so the ensure correct uh, so you should calibrate your sprayer a, a sprayer sprayer 101 is a very good website it has more detailed information for example in this case uh, if you are using those cards when you are using the you, when you are applying the fungicide you can see that a uh, too too much or uh, too low coverage is not good it should be enough coverage as indicated here the last point is the integrated uh, disease management if you consider the integrated disease management here if we know the uh, disease triangle so to in order to develop a disease it needs a susceptible host uh, a virulent aggressive pathogen and favorable environmental conditions so with these practices like those agronomic practices we try to uh, to to imp to have the environment less conducive to the pathogen development so for example integrated use of so in this case we use all the available countermeasures to avoid or delay fungicide resistance development so you, uh, which includes also use of disease resistant crop varieties so it will reduce the selection pressure the use of disease free seed or root stock or nursery plants use of biological control agents use of crop rotation in case of annual crops removal of uh, disease parts of the perennial crop plants for example for <coughs> so it, in, it is more towards like hygiene making uh, have have the proper hygiene in the field for some disease no known chemical methods do not exist so they and there we have to rotate the fungicide with different mode of action for example potato late blight um, grape uh, downy mildew and stripe rust of wheat um, uh, here i want to just uh, show you a video fungicide repeatedly can lead to the development of populations of resistant fungi this makes the fungicide less effective risking the yield and quality of the harvest so why does fungicide resistance happen well the fungal population is made up of a huge number of individuals with natural variation just like humans animals and plants this genetic variability gives some individuals a higher tolerance to the fungicide If the same fungicide is used every time, those tolerant individuals can survive and reproduce into millions, passing on their tolerance to the next generation, leading to field resistance. Fortunately, things can still be turned around by using a different fungicide to prevent the fungus from developing. But which fungicide to use? Fungicides can be sorted into groups based on their mode of action, which is the way so in the end there are the some useful resources which you uh, which if you want more details you can follow the, you can follow those resources thank you for your attention if you have any question i will be happy to answer them okay great thanks so we did have one question from before it was is there a cost to testing and this was back to the lab component of the presentation Right. So with the virus testing, I'll let Sajid answer quickly after me, but with the virus testing there is um it's $25 per sample for the first virus and then $15 for each additional one, but depending on the number of samples that you're interested in um submitting, we might be able to offer reduced rates. So please contact me about that. 
Yeah, yeah. Regarding the the other pathogens, uh, except viruses, we are still uh, uh, still now the service has been free. But uh, more information we will update over website, and more information will be posted there. Great. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Um, so I just want to thank both of you for speaking. And uh, in honor to all the speakers that presented today, we're going to be making it. Megan, um, there is another question that just popped up on the. All right. A uh, follow up on soil borne diseases. What lab in Nova Scotia performs these? Uh, currently, we are the only one which we, which are providing this service. Okay. Any other last questions? Okay, so we're making a donation to Food First Newfoundland. Uh, they're a nonprofit organization to improve food security in Newfoundland and Labrador. So thank you both. And up next, we were supposed to have Larry Parker, but we think that he had a time change um, mishap. We don't see nope, him. No, Megan, he is logging on right now, he said. He's logging on right now. Okay, great. So just another couple minutes. And Larry, uh, Larry's the Director of Research and Development with Westbridge Agricultural Products. And uh, he's going to be sharing information on their new non-selective organic herbicide called BioLink. So we'll give him a couple minutes to get on here and... He can start sharing his screen. Hey, Larry. Hey. Oh. When you're ready, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, um, we're, yeah. we're ready for your presentation. Okay, sorry, running a little late. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm on California time, so it was... Uh... That's totally fine. The last presenter just finished up, um, so okay. we're ready whenever you are. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay. okay, find where I got to go. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yep, I can see your screen. Okay, good. Move that out of the way here. Okay, well, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to uh, speak to you and go over our BioLink herbicide today. Uh, it is, uh, we received a PMRA registration on the products uh, last year. Uh, so we're just getting started, so. Uh, this is the label for the BioLink herbicide. Uh, it's uh, 
it, it's actually composed of uh, two fatty acids, a caprylic acid and capric acid, which are naturally derived. Uh, one is the, the caprylic acid is a C8 and the capric is a C10. Uh, so uh, it's registered for uh, organic broad spectrum contact. Uh, it can, uh, it burns whatever it comes in contact with. It's uh, non-selective and it's generally used as a post-emergent herbicide. It can be used as a pre-emergent herbicide on some crops such as uh, carrots where you'll plant carrots and then you like irrigate, uh, the weeds come up, you treat, and then, the, uh, then the carrots will emerge afterwards. Uh, it has been used in no-till barley as well too, so it can be used in no-till situation uh, to burn back weeds uh, before you, uh, uh, during planting as well. It's a proprietary low foaming and immers muscle pliable concentrate. Uh, it's been approved for uh, by the Organic Materials Review Institute, and it's <clears throat> also been approved by EcoCert in Canada. And it can be used in all agriculture food, non-food crops, and it can be used around non-agricultural industrial sites. Okay. So the way uh, the product works, it actually disrupts the cuticle and epidermal layers. And so what this does is it breaks down the cuticle. So then the plant uh, actually starts to desiccate. Uh, its activity is against both monocotyledons and dicots. Uh, generally higher activity against dicots because the leaves are broader and it's easier to get the material on. Where monocots, uh, the material will tend to run a little bit. So. Uh, sometimes using a sticker in combination with the, with the product can actually help improve efficacy on uh, monocots. And I will show you some information on that later. Uh, again, it's non-specific, so we'll burn whatever it comes contact with. So, uh, but, so you really wanna avoid drift if you can, but if it does drift, since it's not systemic, it will only burn the tissue that it comes in contact with. Um, it's safe on um, uh, vineyards and orchards that are uh, three years old. You can do the bark test where you can kind of scrape the bark and if you see green on the bark, then uh, you don't want to actually have the product uh, touch the, the, the bark or trunk. Uh, if it's brown, then you're okay. And use a use of rule of thumb is if, if the vineyard or orchard is three years old, then it, you can actually overspray and it will actually kill burn back suckers as well too. Uh, but you wanna get those suckers really young when you do it. So this is an example of what actually it looks like. Uh, this is a, a, a blueberry um, orchard, actually boysenberry, sorry, boysenberry orchard. Uh, the, the olive green grasses were sprayed. Um, and then you can see where there was a, a one of grass on the right hand side, which was not sprayed and over here. And so this was sprayed in the evening and before the, uh, uh, after the sun was going down. And then this is a photograph taken in the morning. So, uh, <clears throat> so it will disrupt the cuticle. Once the sun hits, hits this, then it will start bleaching out. So uh, the sun is really important in terms of uh, the activity of the product. If you can put it on on a nice sunny day, uh, it works really well. Temperature can be in a factor too. Um, generally, we wanna have temperatures above 60 uh, for maximum activity of the product. Uh, the cooler it is, the slower it's gonna work. Uh, if you're up in the uh, 85 to uh, 100 degrees, you'll see the burn starting to occur within typically 15 minutes. So uh, this is uh, just uh, some of the rates that we use. We'll typically use three, six, or 9%. Uh, we have varied anywhere from like four, five, and seven, seven and a half percent range, depending on the weeds. Uh, and uh, generally, we never have to use more than 400 liters per hectare. A lot of the data I'm going to be showing you is going to be actually data using between 200 and 300 liters of water per hectare. Uh, but most of the data I'll be showing you will be of, uh, actually using a 6% solution uh, with the product. 
And that's actually a good starting uh, dosage to work with. Uh, if you get really fast burn on that, then you can play around with uh, lower dosages on it as well. So it's very important to mix the product because it uh, uh, it can settle a little bit in the in the tank. These fatty acids they're oily, so they tend to want to float to the surface. Uh, so you want to mix the jug before. Uh, just shake the jug. It doesn't take a lot of shaking. Just shake it uh, a little bit to get things uh, uniform before you dispense it out of the jug. And then once it once you put it into your spray tank, you want to keep that agitated. One of the main complaints that we had with the product is, oh, it didn't work. And we go out there and we take a look and climb up on the sprayer and it's all floating on the surface. And then we take out where they sprayed and where they started spraying, look like they're spraying water, which they were. And when they finished the tank, everything was, was dead. So it's very important to make sure that uh, it's agitated uh, during that. You wanna use the spray mix within four hours after mixing. Um, and then you wanna make sure you have adequate coverage of the weeds. Uh, the weeds should be shiny. Uh, if they, uh, you just want, don't want little tiny little drops. It's got a whole surfactant package in it, which helps it spread on the leaves. Uh, and so the whole leaf should be uh, glistening. Uh, the, you want to adjust the spray water pH below six. And actually, if you get down to uh, three or four, it's even better. Um, and that's what we use our bionic uh, acidifier for, uh, for doing that. Um, so, uh, you typically do not want to use silicon-based surfactants or non-ionic surfactants because we already have them incorporated into the product. Uh, but in some cases, uh, you can use uh, a silicone, but you really want to use a, a very low rate of it uh, because uh, it can cause the product to run to the, the, off the leaves. And all you see, will see is burning on the margin of the leaves. So. This is a, shows you uh, what the product does when you just put it in the water, it will float to the surface. And if you agitate it, you get this dilute uh, milky appearance on it. And that will, is on the rights what you want it to look like. You don't want to apply it to weeds uh, uh, when they're wet to dew or rain or water, because that just increases the water and that'll increase runoff. So you want to wait until the weeds are dry. Uh, do not water within four hours after application and uh, do not apply if you expect rainfall within four hours. Generally, it's going to be in the product or in the plant and working within a few minutes, uh, but uh, we just have this as a precaution on it. Uh, if it's a hot, sunny day, sometimes you can drop down to two hours before a rain event. Uh, but generally, if you've got a rain event coming, it's usually cloudy, so it's, it's usually you want to have that four hour uh, interval. Uh, ensure adequate ventilation if you're using this in greenhouses or tunnels. Uh, it does have a fatty acid odor, which is kind of be, can have kind of a rancid odor, with, which uh, can be offensive to some people. Uh, tractor speed is really important. You want to be less than four kilometers an hour. Uh, it's another issue. We have growers that get out there at 10 kilometers an hour, and when you look at it, you just don't get the coverage on, on the product. So tractor speed is really important. Uh, nozzles are also important. We've had very good set success using ADO2s, 8002s, uh, have been uh, very consistent in terms of efficacy with the product. So it has a zero PHI. Uh, so it's 24 hour reentry. So you can go back in if you have personal protective equipment uh, on. Uh, and then you don't want to apply this to standing waters or intertidal areas. Uh, uh, and you do not uh, contaminate the rinsates into these into these waters. These are kind of standard boilerplate uh, 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 recommendations for uh, all basically all pesticides. Uh, do not apply the product or allow it to drift to blooming crops uh, because it, it does not kill bees, but it does tend to want to uh, uh, repel the bees a little bit. I've actually tried to spray bees to see if it would kill them, and I wasn't able to actually spray a bee because I could get about six inches from the beads and bees would take off. So, uh, and the, but the, the bee studies we have done actually shows that it does not kill the bees if it does get on them. Uh, this is some of the early work we did with the University of California. Uh, we, we worked closely with them and developing a lot of the, of the formulation. We'd work formulations and send them up to them. So this is one of our earlier ones. Uh, 
the disease rating here, damage rating is zero, no damage, and 10 is completely dead. And three different rates, three, six, and 9%. And looking at it over time at the bottom. And you can see there's not a lot of difference between the, the, the six and 9%. They work pretty close to one another. Uh, these were on really young, uh, young weeds that were, you know, like two inches, less than two inches. And so when you have really young weeds like that, you can sometimes go to the lower rates of the product. Uh, this is showing water volume. Uh, the University of California, typically with all organic fertilizers, were, was, re was recommending 654 uh, liters of water per hectare, which is about 70 gallons of water per acre. We felt our product was way more efficient than that, so we, we did the study and it showed that uh, we could actually go down to 374 and get just, get just as good efficacy as if we were uh, at uh, 654, and we now know that we can go down to about 230, 220 liters of water per hectare and still have the same uh, efficacy of the product. May take a little bit longer for the, for the efficacy to occur, but we still get the, the burn back on it. Uh, the product can be phytotoxic to crops. So, uh, so here we have uh, the, uh, the wheat and cotton, which are the, the yellow and the blue bars. You can see there's significant burn on those. Those are the dicots. And then the corn and wheat, uh, there's less burn on those because they're the monocots. So when you are working with, uh, say, corn and beans, uh, you want to you want to be working with a shielded sprayer on that to, so you don't get it on on the crop and then on the wheat a lot of times we do that as a pre-emergent on the wheat so this is a apricot orchard this is 72 hours after application the bar up in or the box up in the right hand corner is shows you the wheat profile before treatment and this is after treatment and so this is a 6% solution and 234 uh, liters of water per hectare. So we have uh, you know nice burn back on this. Uh, notice that uh, we have sleeves around the, uh, the trees uh, because these are young and we're just planted. Uh, if we didn't have those, it would have caused some phytotoxicity on them. Uh, this is a, a greenhouse trial, just looking at different uh, weed species and different rates. Uh, you can see three, six, nine. Again, these are all really young weeds. So the University of California, some of the early work that we were doing on it. Uh, and so not a lot of difference between the rates on this, on these very young weeds. And this is on curly dock, wild carrot, and catchweed bed straw. Uh, there are some uh, rate differences here on the catch. Uh, on some of these. So some of these weeds uh, it may require a little bit higher rates. On them. Now this is on the monocots and you can see that the kill increases for 14 days typically and then the, the, the grasses start to regrow. So this is typical of what we see on, uh, uh, on a lot of weeds, especially if they're larger weeds. Uh, we'll see that we'll kind of, we'll burn them back, but then uh, you'll start getting regrowth at, at, from the carbohydrates that are stored in the root mass. Uh, typically we'll come back in at 21 days and do a second application. And on some weeds that will actually kill the weed by that time because, it, but it all depends on the root mass that you have. The bigger the root mass uh, it may take up three applications to get things under control. Uh, this is just comparing it to a number of different uh, 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 other organic products. Uh, the pelagonic acid is a C9 product. Uh, the red, that's the purple up above. And you can see that uh, the pelagonic, that was actually scythe that was used in this trial here. Uh, and the suppress, uh, both fatty acids, uh, uh, both work very similar. Uh, I'll show you some data. This is again with some early formulations back in 2010 that we actually have better efficacy now uh, than the pelagonic acid. Um, you know, citic acid had very good activity initially. Uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, toxicity issues uh, with the citic acid. You have to be very careful with it and you don't get as good a residual with, with the product. And delimonene wasn't very effective and the, the clove oils weren't that effective. 
Now, this is the other product that, that we, we use to acidify the, uh, the biolake herbicide. It's bio, our biolake acidifier. And this product is uh, a 50% citric acid. Uh, and it's actually very effective at dropping the pH uh, and getting that pH down there. So typically what we're using is a 1% solution. Uh, you can go 0.5 to 1%, but generally we're using 0.5 or 0.1%, and that'll drop the water pH down to, uh, it'll get it down to about four. Uh, and that really activates the, the fatty acids and gets them to work better. Uh, if, you know, a lot of times here in California, we're working with the waters that have pH 7.9. Uh, so if you're on the East Coast or up where you are, you may have more acidic waters. Uh, in that case, you may be able to actually get by 0.5% at that time because you're, you're not dealing with the, as high a buffering capacity of, of your spray water. Uh, the product can actually be used in a number of different ways. We use it to acidify uh, 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 actual other products uh, because a lot of pesticides have to be under acid conditions, otherwise they undergo alkaline conditions. Uh, so we'll use, uh, or we can actually, use, we'll use like 0.25 to one liter uh, of it. Uh, oh, sorry, that's that's with our 0120, which is a, a, another product which it's not registered in Canada, uh, but we'll you it it we'll use uh, you know 0.5 to one uh, percent liters per thousand liters of water uh, to just spray waters on that. So it it doesn't take uh, a lot of product to really drop pHs on that. And we can also use it to adjust the pHs of irrigation water as well too. And we do that. We usually use uh, a, a a gallon per uh, 100 liters of water, uh, but uh, we'll do that right at, I'm mean, sorry, that'd be a gallon per per 1,000 gallons of water. Uh, but we'll do that right at the end of the irrigation. You don't have to, if you have high pH waters and salt issues, you don't have to use this product throughout the, uh, to, to acidify all the water. You only need to acidify the water that's actually, that's in the root zone. So we'll do that in the last 30 minutes, we'll run the product in. Uh, to an irrigation to help acidify uh, right around the root zone, which also helps chelate micronutrients and make them more available. So this will give you an uh, example of the BioLink acidifier. Uh, this is actually with a new product that we have to the Xena. That is a our new spreader sticker, which is we're working on trying to get that registered with PMRA right now. At first, we didn't think it was going to have to because it's an adjuvant. However, uh, uh, PMRA said because it's increasing uh, pesticide activity, uh, we, they have to register through PMRA. So it may take about 18 months to get that uh, registered in Canada. Ampersand is another product that, that's a sticker. Uh, it shows the advantage of our Xena is, is more effective. But the acidifier um, is the dark colored line. So the acidifier is the dark green and the dark red. So you can see how it's enhancing the activity uh, of the, uh, uh, by, of the uh, biolink herbicide. Oh, I should say, this says suppress. Suppress is actually the, Uni the United States registered trademark for the biolink herbicide. We weren't able to get that in Canada. So it's called biolink herbicide in Canada and suppress in the United States. So there may be a few slides in here that might that I forgot to change the name on. Uh, so this is the biolink herbicide, uh, and uh, in combination with the so uh, we looked at four uh, percent of the product, and we looked at five percent of the product. So the the light green here, this is four percent. Uh, uh, so the light green, as you go through here, is uh, without the acidifier, and the dark green is with the acidifier. And the light blue is without the acidifier, and then the the, the uh, dark blue here uh, is with the acidifier. So you can see where we've added the acidifier, uh, we're we're getting up to 90, 95 percent control on a lot of these uh, grasses. And this is on broadleaf weeds. The same thing here. You can see the light green to the dark green, and the light uh, blue to the dark blue. Uh, and when we, we add the Xena in combination here, we're, we're running 95 to 100% control of, of a lot of these weeds. And we even have this perennial uh, field vine weed convol convolvulus in there as well too. Uh, pretty good control on that. 
Uh, this is a, a trial that was done up in Ontario. And so the, uh, the, the green bar here is uh, the biolink herbicide. Uh, this is the non-weeded control down here. Uh, the weeded control is where they come in and just hand weed in here. And so you can see that we're looking 70 to 80% weed control uh, uh, here. And then this is uh, the yields that you would be getting on, on the product compared to the unweeded control. So it does significantly have a benefit on it. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, on uh, blueberries uh, up in Canada. And you can see where the product was treated in here. We've got pretty good burn back uh, there. Uh, we have a perennial weed in here. Uh, we had a little bit of issues on that. You can see that it's kind of burning the margins of the leaves, but it's keeping things really clean down here at the base of the plants. Uh, this is in Oregon. Uh, you can see here in the check, uh, what we were dealing with is some pretty heavy weed control or weed high grasses here. And with uh, two applications of here, we did a pretty good job of clearing things back. This is actually a convolvulus here. Uh, and uh, field bind weed. So it's showing that it's really kind of cleaning things up. Didn't damage the, the blueberries because they're older. So there was no problem uh, with phytotoxicity on the blueberries. Uh, we do have a, a sucker that's being burned back as well too. Uh, this is on raspberries. So this is before treatment. Uh, this is three hours after treatment. And this is two days after treatment. And you can see on the grasses, we've done a pretty good job burning them back, but there is a little bit of green left in here. So coming back in about uh, three weeks, uh, do with a second application will help take out a lot of those grasses. Now this is on raspberries. Uh, you can see the weed control here, uh, no phytotoxicity on these. Uh, so on the raspberries, so we had very good control, weed control there. Uh, this is on palm fruit. Uh, the untreated and the treated. Uh, so this is also on palm fruit, untreated versus the treated. And you can see in here, they'd actually done things before, uh, but you still have a pretty good set of weeds coming back up and it did a pretty good job of cleaning things up. When it happens, when you come back in here, what you can actually do is send somebody back through with an ATV and just spot spray sometimes. You don't have to actually come back in and spray the whole, the whole field. Uh, this is Wash, uh, uh, Washington State University trial. So this is a uh, pre-treatment. They're getting ready to spray. And this is after treatment here. So you can see where they've sprayed in here. They have nice uh, uh, control here. A little bit of green still left in some of these larger grasses. Uh, again, you might have to come back and spot spray in with some of these grasses that are there. This is on organic pears. Uh, nice cleanup here. As well, again, you can see some of the grasses, they missed some spots in here, which they didn't hit, uh, but, uh, but it did burn the grasses back. Now, these are pretty large weeds here. So these, I suspect, will start to regrow. Uh, so it will take a second application. And actually, in this, this block, they actually got, because there were so many grasses here in the untreated, it was actually taking up a lot of the nutrients. And they got about a 20% increase in yield just by eliminating the grasses and allowing, getting better fertilizer efficiency to the plant. So, um, this is a grower trial in the Pacific Northwest. And so what we're looking at here is hand weeding is, is the, the purple bar here. And this is the, uh, the biolink herbicide. So you can see very, very good control, uh, very close to hand weeding uh, and the cost for application is going to be significantly less than hand weeding with the product. And then this is just some other uh, materials that uh, organic herbicide. And this is just showing uh, on an apple orchard. This happens to be in Switzerland. And we're looking at six days, 21 days, and 56 days after application. Now, this is done uh, with a 9% solution in uh, 200 liters of water. They did have a very large, oops, uh, large weeds in this case. Uh, but you can see that on these different uh, weeds that we're even having after 56 days uh, on some of them up to 85% control on some of these. So we could do have some pretty good residual activity over a long period of time by just knocking them back early. 
Uh, this is on soybeans. Now this was done with a shielded sprayer. Uh, and so you can see the, the, the check here where it's not weeded, not sprayed, and then where, it's, uh, where it has been sprayed here. And this is on uh, no-till barley. Uh, so this is uh, where we sprayed the myelin herbicide. Uh, this, this is actually the, the uh, pelagonic acid right here, which is the scythe. And this is wolverine and uh, glyphosate. And this is after six weeks, uh, you know, uh, looking at the overall weed control, cumulative weed control over six weeks. And this is uh, looking at malva and then overall control. This is actually in a, uh, uh, we grow a lot of lettuce here in California. So this is actually in some uh, lettuce, uh, but you can see the biolake herbicide here. This again is the pelagonic acid here. And then this is, uh, this is shark. Uh, is the product here and then several other but we get excellent we're getting excellent control here in fact the when the researcher actually went out and looked out the field he thought that the violent herbicide was actually the shark uh, until he looked at his plot map and this will show you how clean it actually was uh, and you can see the little lettuce plants here so they're actually using the product at uh, two percent in a lettuce thinning machines where they come in and they do a band right here, so actually thin, takes out all the weeds. So there's uh, some interesting ways that they're doing it. Uh, this is in a vineyard. Uh, this, you can see the size of the grasses here. So they're very large. So they did go with a high rate here to try to burn these back. Uh, you can see right here where the pointer is, that's an irrigation line. The issue that they were having is the grasses would get so big that it would actually, when they come in with their weed eaters that to rip up the grass, it would actually get wrapped around the irrigation lines and it would rip out the irrigation line. Uh, when, when after spraying here, they came back in and the grasses were real brittle and so they were able to clean up really nice. Uh, they now use significantly less uh, volume of water and product as well because they have things under control and they don't have to use as uh, much product. There's a vineyard here showing the, the, uh, you know, the efficacy of the product here. And again, 6% and 234 liters per water. Uh, this is 6% here. This is actually done with a, a, a backpack sprayer. Uh, they, and this is down in the desert, down in Coachella, which is uh, down almost in the Mexican border. Uh, but it was uh, about 95 degrees when they're spraying this. So you can see we got, and this is uh, purple nut sedge, which is very difficult to hold control. So this burned it back. It will, uh, it will tend to come back up. So they're gonna have to come back in with a second spray on that one. Now you can also use it in combination with uh, glyphosate and glufosinate. Uh, so on the left here, you, this would be rely and like Roundup. Uh, this is four months after application. You can see that the grasses are coming back here. And you can see here where we actually included the, uh, uh, the biolake herbicide in combination with that. Uh, it, we got much better control. And if you actually look down the rows, you can actually see how much cleaner uh, uh, the rows are. So, it, and there we're using it one, per two, one to 2% solution uh, just to help enhance. It can also help uh, give you a little control of herbicide resistant reeds as well when you're going in with like a glyphosate. Uh, this is on wine grapes and this is uh, done in Switzerland here. We're looking at 21 and 56 days after application. So we're, so, uh, we're looking at, uh, this was uh, done with a 9% solution because they were dealing with large weeds to start with. But uh, 21 days, we were running, you know, uh, between 78 to 95% control. Uh, by the time we get to 56, you know, we do see a little bit of drop because we do have a little bit of regrowth here, but we still have pretty significant control with the product even after 56 days. Now, this is on onions. Uh, on onions, you can actually come in over the top on onions and garlic and leeks. Uh, so what we have here, this is the untreated here, and this is the treated here. Uh, this is this part right here is actually this part right here. So this is a close up of what this part is over here. But what you do with the onions, it has to be done before you hit the three leaf stage. 
So this was done with three applications. They did 3% and 300 liters of water per, per hectare. Uh, they did it at the whip stage, which is when the first leaf actually hasn't sprung out yet. So it's still kind of curled back in uh, the two leaf stage and the three leaf stage. After the three leaf stage, you can start getting significant phytotoxicity and it can actually impact yields. But as long as you get it in early, uh, it won't have an impact on the yields. And this just shows how clean it is. I should also point out too that uh, they're primarily going after broadleafs here because in Europe, you cannot use organic uh, herbicides or any herbicide or organic or non-organic and organic uh, uh, fields. So this is actually a conventional field. They treated with a pre-emergent grass herbicide to keep the grasses under control. And so they're coming back uh, because uh, glyphosate's being banned. So they have come back with uh, 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 the violent herbicide uh, to do the broadleaf weeds. Uh, this is just uh, uh, another trial here in the onions, uh, just showing the control. So 53 days, 74 days, and 88 days. So even after 53 days, we still have 76%, 95%, and 90% control. So we had excellent control uh, even after three, 53 days. So it's a, it's a good, useful tool to help keep things clean throughout the whole growing season. And on some crops, you get them early, then the plant will outgrow the weeds and then uh, help shade out the weeds. Uh, this is a, uh, another trial. Um, and so you, you can see that we're, again, we're still, we're running up 76 to 80% control here. And as we get out even 78 days out there, we still have above 60% control. So this is on strawberries. Uh, you know, when you're using plastic, you cannot uh, treat uh, right close to, the, or you can't plow right close to or till right close to the plastic, otherwise you rip the plastic out. So they actually use it, uh, They've been using it in between here. There's a dead weed right back in here, so the untreated. And this just shows you this is uh, uh, the efficacy of the product in terms of burning things back. And then this is a this is actually in rangeland. We have used it in rangeland as well. Uh, looked at it at a another uh, process because what happens? You start you know you, you overgraze this, and a lot of the grasses that you want in there. Uh, you get these thistles and things coming out and, uh, and out competing the grasses. And so you get degradation of rangeland. Uh, so we <clears throat> they actually looked at two applications of the product uh, at 6%, two applications at 9%. And then they did, they mowed first and then used a 9%. And I typically in rangeland, I recommend this application is uh, the mow it, knock it back, uh, that takes back a significant amount of the carbohydrates. Then you come back in and burn back everything in there. So, and two different locations here. So we use that, we were looking over 90% control and then 85% control. So it can be a useful tool for reclaiming uh, organic rangeland. Now we are running it through PMRA to use the product as a potato desiccant. Uh, and hopefully we are hoping that we might have this uh, uh, for uh, this fall, uh, but this is looking at your red lung, uh, agritane, and this is a bionic herbicide at 9% uh, and 30 gallons of water per acre. We now know we do not have to go as high as 90% uh, or 9%. We we're actually in some cases going uh, three and 6% and, and uh, slowly burning things back and doing two applications. Uh, so this is a, a, a Swiss trial and just gives you an uh, example how quick it works. So the red bars are the uh, conventional herbicides and then the blue bars are the non-anoic acid, this is pelagonic acid, which is a C9. And then the green bars are the, uh, are, the biolink herbicide. So you can see the biolink herbicides working just as good uh, as the conventional uh, uh, herbicide here for burning down the, the tops and works much faster than the, the, uh, the pelagonic acid. So the product is available in 10 liters, 113 liter drums, 200 liter drums, and then uh, uh, shuttles or, or uh, 
that are uh, uh, 1,040 liters. So, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, there are yeah. some questions here. So okay. the first question, Larry, is has it been tried on hops? Uh, yes, it has been used on hops and hops are really interesting because uh, a lot of times what they do is they'll just come in and they'll spray around the, uh, you know, the hop plant to keep the weeds out of control there. So it can be used on hops. Again, ideally you want to use uh, a shield sprayer until they, until they get up in pretty good size, uh, but with a shield sprayer to protect the plant on that, but it has been used on hops. Great, thank you. And the other question there, is there a time that BioLink can be used on asparagus that won't hurt the asparagus without having to shield it? Yes, but that's typically when you're allowing it to go to the fern stage. So, one, so after you're done harvesting and you're allowing it to go to the fern stage uh, to, re, to uh, recoup for the next year, then you can actually get it in there because the stems at that time become more woody and it does not damage damage in there. So we've done that in Peru actually and had very good success with it in Peru uh, for treating spares. But uh, you can e you either want to do it as a pre-emergent uh, before the spare starts to emerge or you're going to want to do to kind of clean things up early or you're going to want to wait until the fern stage to do, and do it late to kind of control the weeds, kind of clean things up for the next season. Perfect. Are there any other questions for Larry? I don't see any. All right. Well, I really appreciate it, Larry. Thank you for okay. presenting today. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have to leave because I got to run to another presentation here. <laughs> okay, and as a thank you, we'll be making a donation to Feed First Newfoundland and Labrador uh, to thank you for presenting today. So, thank okay, you. good. Thank you. All right, so now I'm going to put up the CCA code for anyone that has Certified Crop Advisor. Uh, you can use the app to scan this. So you should be able to see that code. And I just want to thank Syngenta Canada again for sponsoring today's meeting. And thank you all for attending. It went a little over time, but we appreciate your time. Um, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to let one of us at the Agri Mart know. And hopefully you have a good afternoon.